Hi, I'm Mimi Gerges. Vladimir Putin's Russia planned and executed a campaign to undermine our democracy and influence our 2016 presidential election. How did they do it? Why? And what are they planning next? This is of the scale of 9-11, if not bigger, in terms of the impact on democracy. If we don't have confidence in those elections, you really don't have a well-functioning democracy. Welcome to the Mimi Gerges Show. American intelligence agencies have described the Russian interference campaign into the 2016 election as unprecedented in its scale. That operation involved leaks of tens of thousands of stolen emails, the flooding of social media sites with false claims, and the purchase of ads on Facebook and Google. Moscow's goals were to undermine public faith in the U.S. democratic process and help elect Donald Trump. The Kremlin and President Trump have denied any collusion. Heather Conley is a senior vice president at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and Josh Meyer is a senior investigative reporter at Politico. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thanks. Josh, there are several investigations going on. There's Mueller's, there's a couple of congressional investigations. Where does all this stand? Uh, it's very fluid right now, Mimi. I think that um, you know the Senate and the House Intelligence Committee investigations are the ones that we should really look at to see you know, what happened during the election, you know, what the sort of information and influence operations uh, by Russia did, and to what extent did they influence the election. The other ones, I think, the Judiciary Committee in particular is more looking at, you know, whether any laws were broken. But in terms of big picture stuff, I think that the Intel Committees, especially the Senate, are the ones that are going to be driving this. And so, you know, they're trying to bring in people now for private meetings and interviews, and soon we're going to see some public hearings. I can't wait to hear what kind of questions are asked and what kind of information they're getting. We're also seeing information leaking out of the committees now and by Facebook, Twitter, and even Google themselves to try to get ahead of these investigations. So you're seeing what kind of ads were purchased by you know, suspected Russian entities. Uh, one thing that we're going to be see seeing more of is, is organic content, you know, that there's a lot of concern that it wasn't just the paid ads, but it was you know, creating individual accounts, uh, uh, resurrecting fake and, and suspended accounts. I mean, there's potentially millions of those out there just sort of floating around. And also just creating bot activity that was driving narratives and really could have influenced and, and, and changed the outcome of the election. Do you think we'll see anybody, is anybody going to go to jail for this? I think that there's a big disconnect, especially when the, with the public's sort of the granularity of the understanding about this in the sense that most of what Russia might have done on the social media campaigns isn't really illegal. I mean, a lot of the laws are still, you know, arcane technology laws that were rooted in the sort of the 1970s and the 1980s. And so there's few, if any, specific statutes that they can really use to go after people, especially overseas, if they're creating fake accounts or, or starting to, you know, gin up um, conflicts between Americans over immigration and things like that. Um, you know, Black Lives Matter, there was a lot of that stuff. Uh, or even that Hillary Clinton, for instance, was dying of exotic diseases when it wasn't true, or things that helped President Trump. So um, if there are gonna be any criminal charges, I think it would be on the Trump end, you know, anybody in the Trump campaign and the administration, uh, probably on um, any obstruction of justice that might have occurred. Collusion is a really hard thing to prove. You know, one thing that I would love to find out is, is what are the authorities doing on the Russia end? I mean, who are they talking to over there? Because you can't really prove collusion unless you have both ends of it. So uh, I think, you know, the people that say that we're going to uh, need to wrap this up in a few months, I mean, that's ridiculous because these investigations can take years. Do you think that's what it's going to take? Well, I mean, I think there's concern that it won't take that long and that we won't get to the bottom of it. You know, I think, um, I mean, I investigated and wrote a book about the 9-11 attacks, and I think that, you know, to this day, there's a lot of questions asked about that. And part of the reason is because there's never been a public accounting of it. I mean, there's been a 9-11 commission and, and a million books, but you know, the, the US government has never laid out the evidence that they have uh, in a court of law or a military tribunal uh, to show exactly what you know, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and bin Laden and the other people did. So without that kind of disclosure of, of formal evidence, there's always gonna be questions raised about it. And I think that that could happen here as well. So this could actually take the whole four years of Trump's term. Or eight years. Uh, no, no, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, well, it conceivably, I mean, Bob Mueller said this when he was FBI director about the Lockerbie plane crash. He said like 23 years later, they were still, you know, answering questions, finding clues. And, you know, in the mind of the public, 
you know, I think that this is of the scale of 9-11, if not bigger, in terms of like the impact on democracy. And my big concern is that, you know, we're not gonna get to the, to the bottom of this, especially with the configuration right now of the committees investigating it. They, they don't have a lot of people, they don't have a lot of resources. I mean, the Republicans are, you saw the report of Trey Gowdy, you know, saying to Jared Kushner, you know, that two hours of interview is enough and that he should leave even if he was willing to stay. And this is the same person who spent three years investigating the Benghazi attacks. So, you know. So very partisan, really, in the right, congressional investigation. Right, and now you're seeing them, you know, throwing up all of these investigations into the uranium alleged plot by the Clinton Foundation and Obama administration and, and the dossier and whether or not who paid for it and the provenance of it, you know, was going to impact or, or undermine, um, you know, its authenticity. So this is becoming so politicized. I think if you're out there in Kansas or something, you probably have no idea what's going on. I mean, we have no idea what's going on in some respects it in is Washington. Complicated. So yeah. Can President Trump fire Bob Mueller? Sure, he can do whatever he wants. He's the president. So um, my somewhat informed understanding of that is that everybody is telling him, look, you really can't do that, um, even though. If they hadn't been, he might have, who knows what he might have done already. But um, yeah, he can do that. But um, he could fire the attorney general, I mean, and the deputy attorney general. I mean, that could happen. Um, it could undermine the credibility of any investigation even more than it already has, if, if that's possible. Um, so, you know, this is a very fluid situation. Heather, let me ask you, why would Russia do this? Why would they want to interfere in our election? So there are a lot of analysis to try to understand the why. My belief is to erode faith and confidence in liberal democracies, in U.S. leadership, in U.S. alliances. If you look at the parallels of the collapse of the Berlin Wall, in some ways we understood that as a victory of democracy and liberal democracy, that our system was in fact mm -hmm. stronger, more durable. Yeah. How ironic 25 plus years later, it is the lack of confidence in democracy and economies and in our system that is, is sort of bringing us down. As I like to say, all of this, the elements of the, of the investigation, Russia did not cause this. They are amplifying our own internal divisions. They're just exploiting the weaknesses that we present. But there is a much greater and larger objectives here. It is to erode European unity. It is to erode NATO, uh, U.S. leadership mm -hmm. in the world. Because that way, when you sort of take the U.S. out of the equation, when there's no more faith in democracies, then the Russian system, uh, which is Putinism, uh, which is a uh, you know individual led by an inner circle that's extremely corrupt. That's a preferred model. That's a that's a strong control model based on, in Putin's uh, view, the unique civilization of Russia based on conservatism and traditionalism. He, he decries the decadence of the West. He decries all the grievances that we've uh, done to Russia. So it's about leveling the playing field. We're not any better than Russia. It's the moral equivalency. Many times President Trump has emphasized that equivalency. And uh, then when we're equal, then we can create a new grand bargain. And that's why I think the uh, Russian government officials like to, to say this is the Cold War period or we're going back to that because in that era, it was just two countries, the United States and the Soviet Union. They resolved every world crisis, but we certainly so they didn't. they want to go back to the, the Cold War? They want War? to go back to the parallelism of mm -hmm. the Us Cold them, War. Yeah. Yes, they're not going to, they are not capable of reconstituting the Soviet Union economically. They can't reconstitute their greatness as they you know, see it historically, but if they can reduce us, then we're as equals, we can come together and then we can perhaps redesign the European security architecture, go back to those spheres of influence. That is yours, this is mine. Mm -hmm. We may have shifted the line a thousand kilometers east, but they want to go back to that because it staves off their own long-term demographic, economic decline, which is significant, but well, So is that at the center, or is it just that they preferred Donald Trump to Hillary Clinton? So I take the view that it was to build, you know, and discredit our democracy. Uh, that is at its essence, um, and, and that is the, you know, using the Black Lives Matter, anything that divides us, 
anything, they're mm -hmm. going to amplify it. And then because they can point to other countries who, you know, seek the U.S. as an inspiration, who, who see our uh, military strength, our economic strength as a source of inspiration, you don't want that. That's, ugh, that is, you, you know, you can come to our side. We're more, we've got this uh, figured out. Uh, that was the main point. Did they get what they wanted? So we have sort of had this thought of, is this sort of like the dog finally catching the car? You got it. I mean, clearly there was deep personal animosity towards Hillary Clinton. Uh, in some ways, what sharpened this was as President Putin experienced the largest demonstrations in Russia when he declared that he was returning to the Kremlin in the fall of 2011, one of the first senior officials to speak about this, uh, you know, I'm, I'm declaring I'm returning, this is how managed democracy works, I'm going to tell you how this is going to work. Uh, Hillary Clinton was one of the very first in, in Vilnius, Lithuania, no, no mm -hmm. less, to say this is, this is not appropriate. He took it very personally. Again, he thinks that any demonstration is Western-led. He does not understand, no, it's the dignity of the individual who says, I don't want this system. I don't, maybe I don't want American democracy, but I don't want this. He doesn't understand that, you know, every demonstration is Western inspired, so he'd like to return the favor, inspire some mm -hmm. division and revolution in our own country. They've done this to other countries, this Absolutely. meddling in elections. So this doesn't surprise you since you've studied all this. So, uh, you know, being a European analyst, I've sort of had a front row seat uh, to some very early tactics. And again, this is just a system of, we have had so many wake up calls and we just hit, kept hitting the snooze button. Uh, as early as 2007 in Estonia, a massive cyber attack mm -hmm. uh, to, a, to a country that, my goodness, is, is one of the uh, world leaders in e-governance, e-commerce, um, just because they moved a, a statue that was dedicated to the liberation by the Soviet Union of Estonia. Uh, 2008, the Russian-Georgian conflict, which six months later, we reset our relationship with Russia after Russia invaded Georgia. So then, you know, okay, okay, and we'll keep hitting the snooze button, and then events in Crimea and Ukraine, and you could not hit the snooze button anymore. But they had been hacking the German parliaments, uh, Angela Merkel's uh, political party in France. They were uh, amplifying the Brexit referendum. They're amplifying right now the Catalonia dispute. So mm -hmm. any division that yeah. we present, they amplify, and you can't tell what's true and what's not true. Now, the Obama administration in 2016, maybe before that, knew that this was happening in the election. Do you feel like they should have done more, that they didn't take it seriously enough? It's fine for us in hindsight to, to look at it, but my frustration is, yes, they, uh, they were understanding to some elements what was going on. Look, the Obama administration had been warned in 2009 from Central European leaders that this was happening in mm -hmm. their countries. Yeah. They begged the president to look more closely. And it, those warnings were ignored. It, it just, it's just a list of sort of all the things because we didn't think they'd have the audacity to do it here. They couldn't do it to us. They couldn't do it to us. And then I think it, it was just, it was painful that President Obama just felt that this was again, he was getting, going to get involved in the politics of the election and weigh it. Uh, you know, again, in hindsight, your first uh, and only goal is to protect the country, the, mm. the uh, you know, let history judge, but you have to protect the country. And I just felt enough was not done in the Obama administration to protect the country until it was too late. And now tragically, as we gear towards 2018, the midterm elections and 2020, we are again not protecting the country from yeah. this type of influence. I mean, I agree with everything you said. And you know, one thing that people have to keep in mind is this is, this has been going on for decades and it's not just the United States. I mean. Um, you know, Putin has been, uh, you know, there, there must be th an army of people doing this. I mean, uh, I wrote a story last year about how uh, the Obama administration sent a team over to Montenegro because they were looking at that as a microcosm of what could happen in the U.S. election, which is setting up fake think tanks and fake media organizations and experts and, you know, uh, the social media part, the hacking of emails. Um, somebody described it as sort of a blitzkrieg, which is, you know, air power, land power, and sea power all together. It's not just one thing. I mean, they're, they're doing all of that at the same time. So, and they're doing it in a lot of different countries. So for them to say that, that you know, that they didn't think that they could actually go after the United States, I mean, I just think that that's flat wrong. I mean, Fiona Hill, who is now, you know, one of the top people 
you know, at, within the Trump administration on Russia, you know, she told me, and she wrote a book about Putin, she told me that as soon as she had left government the first time and went to a think tank, you know, all her files were hacked. I mean, they were systematically hacking people going in and out of government, all of the subject matter experts. Remember, they also hacked the White House um, non-secure, non-classified channel. They, they hacked uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff. They hacked the State Department. And this was at least a year before the, before the election. So, you know, for them to say that they didn't, you know, have any inkling that this could happen, I just think is, is also not true. Um, in terms of whether they, the dog finally did catch the car, um, I think there is an element of that, but I also think that one thing that's important to stress is they really did despise Hillary Clinton. So Putin believes and insists that the U.S. government was trying to meddle in the Russian election back in 2011, and I think that there does need to be um, sort of an open airing of the facts here, which is that the United States does do some of that stuff. I mean, I don't think we hack and weaponize emails, but we we hack like other people. I was going to ask that we, question, We do actually. fund opposition groups and research and things like that. I mean, And the CIA you know, has right, out right. meddled in other countries' elections. Yes. So is this just us getting a taste of our own medicine? Well, this, this is a step further than anybody's seen in terms of the, you know, w what we as journalists kept writing about sort of as this was transpiring was that it's not new that governments hack each other. What's new is that they weaponize the information. Um, and so that is something that the sort of Cold War spy versus spy superpowers uh, has not seen. So that, that was a red line. But the question is, if it was such a red line, you know, why wasn't more done? Um, I think that the Obama administration, their, their official response is that, you know, we didn't want to impact the election one way or the other by saying something, but, you know. He's you know, still the president. He needs to do something about it. Right. right. And when you look back at it, you know, at the viability of the election system is at risk. You have to do something. I mean, this is somewhat overlooked, but General Clapper, who was the head of the Directorate of National Intelligence, said yeah. recently that he believes that the integrity of the election um, is in question. I mean, that's a huge thing to say. So. Well, and I think that the distinction with what Russia is doing, this is part of their military doctrine called new generation warfare. Right. I mean, while yes, uh, the United States uh, does support political party development, mm -hmm. we support, you know, strengthening institutions, right. absolutely. Right. And yes, of course, there is covert uh, means there. Mm -hmm. But again, that's because we believe uh, and help strengthening civil society and institutions as right. part of who we are. But this is about a military doctrine that is described as a strategy of influence, not of brute force. Mm -hmm. And it's to ensure that the coherency of the enemy system is not able to function. Right. And how do you do that? You focus on elections because if we don't have confidence mm -hmm. in those elections, you really don't have a well-functioning democracy. Right. And, and the stakes could not be higher. And that's why they, right. you know, it's a very effective focus on what they've done. Yeah, I mean, if all they were trying to do was sow discord and undermine our democratic institutions so that people in countries that are sort of on the bubble, you know, that are sort of struggling with whether to go towards a capitalist system or a communist system, um, if, if that tilts the, you know, the needle a little bit in one direction, you know, that's a victory for them. And I think, um, and so, you know, I think that, um, they never would have thought in a million years that they would have had the outcome that did happen. But, but you know, they, they play the long game on this stuff. And so there's... Heather, do you think they expected yeah. Donald Trump to win? Um, well, I, I, I don't believe so. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think from what we can gather, I mean, it's very opaque. It's a very closed mm -hmm. inner circle. That circle's getting even closed tighter. Uh, it's hard to read. I think, in fact, there was some concern of, among the Russian intelligence and community saying, you know, be careful here. Mm -hmm. This can backfire. Uh, and, and in some ways, the, the congressional investigation, it is backfiring because, gratefully, we are having, as, as you know, it may be extremely problematic, it has been, but we have to investigate this and understand where the weaknesses are mm -hmm. and, and how to get, so that in some ways that has exposed what they've been doing. It's heightened a focus in, in uh, Europe, my goodness, the French were on high mm -hmm. alert, the Germans were on high alert, they understood what was coming. The Brexit vote now Absolutely. is Absolutely. So, you know, question. in some ways, the, now in, in the investigative journalism about this has been mm. phenomenal. We yeah. ha that builds public awareness. The problem is, it's not just 
uh, describing how it's working, you have to put in place those mechanisms to prevent it. We have to now start focusing on countermeasures. How can we strengthen right. our institutions? That's what has to come out of these investigations. So for example, whether it's General Mike Flynn, Paul Manafort, the Foreign uh, uh, Agent Registration Act, right. the uh, Shell corporations, the illicit financing potentially through real estate and through all of that is how that influence works. That one's on us. We've got to clean up our system. That's what I hope comes out of the investigation. Collusion, no collusion, that's for others to determine. But the critical thing is clean up our institutions Make and sure our systems. It doesn't happen because again. look, Russia's not going to be the only country, the only adversary mm -hmm. that sees what's going on here. They have created a roadmap for others potentially to use similar tactics. And these tactics are adapting constantly. So it's not just preparing for what they did in 2016, it's thinking about how they're adapting that, that methodology in other areas. The vigilance here is we've got to be really focused on this. And, and tragically, the administration uh, is not, uh, for their own reasons. And so Congress will have mm -hmm. to do what it can, but it's not enough. I mean, Jeff Sessions, the Attorney General, was asked in a congressional hearing last week or the week before, do you think we are doing enough to stop mm -hmm. the Russians from continuing this behavior? And he said no, and he's the Attorney General. So, so what if I'm not it? mistaken, there was not a lot of follow-up to that right. question, which right. is sort of stunning to me. I was meeting with an intelligence person uh, the other night and, and what they said is the biggest, one of the biggest winners in all of this is China because we're so busy focusing on Russia that China is you know, also projecting power and they have this long-term strategy of essentially running the world by 2025, especially now that uh, President Xi has been re-elected <laughs> for five years. But this is like sort of a geopolitical Absolutely. game here. Um, and I think your question, Mimi, about like did the Russians really think he was going to win? I mean, I think it's a it's a sliding scale. Did they think he was going to win at the beginning? No. I mean, nobody did. I mean, Trump, ha you know, didn't. But um, initially they were just trying to sow chaos, I think. Uh, then they were just trying to knock Hillary out because they knew that she would be very aggressive uh, on a foreign policy level against incursions in, in Ukraine and Georgia and things like that. They basically wanted somebody who they thought could be more Malpliant, you know, to 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 what they want to do, somebody that they could steamroll, and and Clinton was not that person, so it didn't matter to them who it was. It was just, you know, um, but then as the election progressed and and then Trump wins the nomination, you know, then they doubled down on this, I think, and so it's it's sort of a rolling effort. You know, they didn't set out to install Donald Trump as president, but they're just watching this kind of stuff very closely, and then sort of trying to manipulate it and steer it in the in the direction they can so um, and I think they got very disappointed maybe yeah. when uh, through a, a yeah. overwhelming bipartisan support in the Senate and the House mm -hmm. uh, basically they legislated those the sanctions US sanctions right. against Russia which pulled at that policy tool out of President Trump's hands yeah. and and then you saw immediately I mean the Russians did, did did nothing until that point and then they realized they're not going to get the gains uh, removing the sanctions imposed after events uh, in Crimea and the Donbass, or you know, no relief on the Sergei Majinsky Act, and now the, the expulsions, the property closures, and yeah. then you began to see where you know now they understood they're not going to get so immediately the, relief. Well, they're going to get some. They're, they might not get all, but but I still think that the you know that Trump, you know, his isolationist policy it sort of plays into what yeah. they want. I mean, he's not going to stop them. I mean, even when they kicked out all of our diplomats, you know, he said, well, that helps us save money, you know, which people in the State Department, the intel community, I mean, they're freaked out by this stuff and very upset about it, you know, and and you're seeing all of the brain, you know, the talent leave some of these, you know, critical departments. Um, I mean, the analogy between this and 9-11, I think that there's a lot of parallels there. I mean, um, one thing that I learned from covering it, but also writing a book about it is that, um, I mean, bin Laden really, you know, was very upset in, in a way when the towers fell down because he thought, oh, you know, I think we we, we overdid, we overdid it, it mm. and now they're going to really come after us. And that that is what happened. And so, I mean, I don't think in their wildest dreams they thought that they w could actually take the towers down. I mean, if they flew a plane into them, that'd be one thing, but they didn't think that they would literally just, you know, crumble, um, catch fire and crumble. And so I think that there's a similar thing here where they they didn't think that they could possibly have this much of an effect. And, you know, all of the other countries around the world that have been, you know, pointing this out f for, for years, if not decades, about this kind of influence operation, it's called active measures, 
as, as the case with a lot of things, once it happens to the United States, that sort of raises the global profile of it. So, you know, I think that in but some ways- But do you think ways, they'll do it again? Will they keep trying is the question. So I believe they will. Yeah. I, I believe, mm -hmm. well, Me again, too. all we're seeing is uh, they've just increased uh, the mm -hmm. operational tempo here. Yeah. Again, not stopping with the U.S., the French elections, the German elections, um, getting ready for the Italian elections next spring right. for Europe. So where there's already division, they are going to fan that. Uh, they are going to do, you know, more nuclear saber rattling to, to scare. Because it's worked, so why it not do it again? It works, it works. And again, we're giving them plenty of weakness. And, and this is where I, you know, when Josh was explaining the, you know, the, the partisanship that's now crept into the mm -hmm. investigation, I, when I had to testify before the Senate Judiciary Committee, I said, you know, there's, there's three elements here that we've got to, to do. First of all, everything we do has to be bipartisan because that partisan, partisanship is division that Russia totally plays into. Mm -hmm. So uh, bipartisanship, transparency. And this is where these investigations have got to shed a light on a lot of financing and illicit mm -hmm. financing that's right. really helping empower Russian influence. And then everything that Congress does in this space has to be has to rebuild trust between the American people and the government. There is so much more to talk about, but yeah. we've run out of time. Oh, Thank you okay. both yeah. so much for being on the program. Yeah. Sure. This has been the Mimi Gerges Show. You can see all of our programs on WHUT.org and YouTube. Connect with us on Facebook and Twitter and leave me your comments there. You can also subscribe to our new podcast. Thanks for watching and I hope you'll join me again next time. This program was produced by WHUT, Howard University Television, and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.